Minnesota from University of Wisconsin at Miyoki is going to talk about a series of chromatic differences. Ah, thank you very much. Um, originally, I was going to talk about um, uh, forgotten topics in Fourier series, but then I forgot what they were, so <laughs> <laughs> I decided not to do that. Uh, instead, I'm going to talk about something that nobody's ever heard about, <laughs> including me. <laughs> uh, this is a series of chromatic differences. Now, if you know what I'm talking about, then you might as well leave because that's what I'm going to do is introduce this uh, subject. Um, um, chromatic differences were, or chromatic series I should say, were originally uh, designed to be an alternative to Taylor's theorem. Taylor's theorem is not very useful in approximations in signal processing, right? It uses the wrong kind of data, number one. It uh, uses derivatives at the origin. Uh, and uh, number two, it, uh, it's not band limited. And real signals are band limited. So Taylor's series is not very good for, from the standpoint of applications. Now, uh, uh, an alternative to Taylor's series is uh, chromatic derivatives and series. Now, you may have heard of those, but probably have not heard of those. So I'll talk a little bit about these things, chromatic derivatives and series, and then tell what's wrong with them, why they don't work as well as they should for uh, functions in Paley-Wiener spaces, for, for uh, functions that are band-limited and are in L2. And uh, uh, then we'll uh, talk about slowly growing band-limited signals. Now, uh, you, you can have a band-limited signal that is not in L2, so it's not in Paley-Wiener space, but still you can analyze it uh, because um, uh, it can have compact support in the, the Fourier transform can have compact support in the sense of distributions. So you get a larger uh, class of functions. And then uh, I'll talk about the problems with these things and go on to chromatic differences and chromatic series. Okay, so uh, what's wrong with Taylor series? Well, here's Taylor series. You start off with a derivative of a function at zero. You uh, have the t to the nth power, and it converges only locally. No matter how good f is, it converges only locally, because these are polynomial approximations. And if you start off with a band-limited function, band-limited signal, the approximation is not band-limited. So it's not very good approximation in the Paley-Wiener space. Okay, now the one way around this was um, an approach invented by Ignatovich in about 1990. He started a, a dot-com organization in California, uh, and so a lot of the stuff he did initially was secret. You know, he didn't want anybody uh, cutting in on his ideas and making money off them before he could. At any rate, uh, what he did is he uh, introduced chromatic derivatives where the nth derivative of a function is replaced by a linear combination of derivatives, a polynomial of derivatives at zero, or the function at zero. And uh, the function, the uh, t to the n over n, the orthogonal, oh, I'm sorry, I got ahead of myself. Uh, p to the n of x here is our uh, system of orthogonal polynomials with respect to a weight function, w of x. And the weight, for the most part, will assume to be, uh, have compact support. So these are classical orthogonal polynomials, or maybe not, they can be any kind of orthogonal polynomials. Okay, now chromatic series, what are they? The Taylor series is replaced by <coughs> this sort of series, where you take these chromatic derivatives, apply to the function at zero, and uh, multiply by this function, phi n of t, and you get an approximation. So you get an approximation which the coefficients are derivatives, and the function is phi n of t, and phi n of t is the inverse Fourier transform of the polynomial times the weight function. So it's something we're, we're all familiar with, in this room at least. Uh, now the thing is, the convergence here is uniform on all of R. If you start off with 
with f of t a, a Paley Wiener function, then this is uniform on all of the real lines. So it, it has a property that Taylor's theorem does not have for Paley Wiener spaces. This only works, however, if, if W here has compact support. If W does not have compact support, uh, you uh, have other uh, properties, but it, we won't go into those now. You can, you can take, uh, uh, say, um, uh, 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 um, Hermite polynomials and get a result for Hermite polynomials, but it's not as nice as it is for, for this one. Okay, that's chromatic series. Now, what do these phi n of t look like? These phi n of t take the place of t to the n in Taylor series. So phi zero, you can see phi zero looks like this. And phi, one, phi three and phi six, etc. Looks familiar, doesn't it?
series to, to uh, approximate uh, uh, functions that are uh, band limited but not in L2, functions that are not in the traditional Paley Wiener space but in the extended Paley Wiener space. So let's look at a couple of examples. Uh, suppose that um, we have f of 2, whoops, getting ahead of myself there, f of 2 given by um, sine of t over 2, then it's in one of these generalized Paley Wiener spaces, uh, b sub pi upper minus 1. If f of f is equal to t cubed, then we have uh, a different Paley Wiener space. Okay. And here's what it looks like. We start off with f2, that was just a sine function. And this is, the, so the green, green line is the original f2, the sine function. And this is the approximation. So you can see it's, it's quite good up to about uh, uh, t equal to 35. And this is a 12 term partial sum. So this method of approximation is very good for, for uh, things like sine series as well. If you go on out to infinity, eventually uh, this comes back down again. So it's a better approximation way out there, I guess, or in that blackboard over there. Uh, but in between, there's this uh, area where it, it's not a very good approximation. But nonetheless, this, this red line, the partial sums, are going to converge in the sense of S prime. That doesn't mean they have to be close locally, but uh, um, at a particular point, say, initially. But they do, if you, if you take an interval, uh, eventually it's going to be uh, uniformly close in that interval. Okay, here's uh, t cubed. As we saw just a while ago, this is also, um, uh, that's t cubed. This is also in that space b sub pi upper minus 4, uh, or is it 5, something along those lines. Uh, and these are the approximations. So the approximations are pretty good, up to, a, well, up to about 0.5, but that's only three and four terms chromatic series. So eventually they'll uh, all get close. So, okay, now, a different approach. As I said, there are a number of things wrong with chromatic series. And one of the things that's wrong with it is you have the input involving derivatives of a function at zero. And it's hard to calculate derivatives like the nth derivative of a function at zero you, just using finite differences. So why not start off with something that will give us finite differences instead of derivatives? And so that's what we're going to do here. Instead of uh, uh, working with polynomials orthogonal on an interval, uh, with uh, respect to a weight function on an interval, we look at the unit circle. and we orthogonalize uh, 1z, z squared on z equal to 1 with respect to uh, a weight function. Okay, and then we get a resulting orthogonal system, uh, which I'll denote by Pn of z. Uh, okay, so this is um, already in Zega's book, uh, so it's old stuff, it's been around uh, 100 years maybe. Uh, and uh, what you get then is um, you have the, uh, the polynomials here, c sub, well, whoops, I got, that should have been z sub k up there, c, k, and z sub k, z upper k. Uh, and you get these polynomials, pn of z. You start off with a band-limited uh, function, h of t, then the coefficients given in this form are the chromatic differences. So it involves the function uh, divided by uh, or the function times the convolution of the inverse of the weight function. Now this, this has to make sense in order for this to work. Uh, and evaluate that at k and stick it in here and you get the coefficients. So it involves differences, it involves the values of a function at, at the integers instead of derivatives. So we call these chromatic differences as opposed to chromatic series. Okay, and now we let 
uh, CN of T be just like it was before. Uh, this is going to be the integral over from minus pi to pi. Uh, these weight functions, of course, are periodic, but we restrict them to minus pi pi. Uh, and uh, we let uh, <coughs> CN of T be equal to that. So it's the same kind of thing we had before. Uh, but then we find that uh, we get a series, and this is called the discrete chromatic series of H of T. Well, seems pretty good so far. Uh, as an example, let's take this simple one again, where our weight function is the characteristic function of the interval from minus pi to pi. Then the polynomials are just z to the n, or on the real line, it's going to be e to the i n theta. And then if we calculate h of t by that formula I just gave you, we get this formula. Looks kind of familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> it looks kind of familiar, but it isn't, because it's a sum from n equals 0 to infinity. So it's not the sampling theorem. It's half of the sampling theorem. This only works if h of t has, is 0 on the negative integers. So we have to restrict ourselves to, um, well, here's the problem. It, it, it doesn't converge in the sense of the paley wiener it can, the, the series converges in the sense of the paley wiener space, but doesn't always converge to the function that you're, you're trying to approximate. It converges to something else. OK, now what kind of function is that? Well, um, let's define a restriction now of b pi and uh, consider uh, only the ones whose Fourier transform, only the functions, uh, where are we? Oh, getting way ahead there. Okay, consider only the ones whose Fourier transform are in H2, the Hardy space H2 of the unit interval. That is, their functions on the boundary of the unit circle, uh, which are uh, boundary values of a holomorphic function inside the unit circle. That would be the, the Hardy space, H2. So if we define B sub pi plus to be what well, you see there, that would be the space for which this uh, decomposition works, for which this, this uh, um, series works. Now that's for, for uh, the weight function positive on minus pi pi. If it's not positive, then we have to restrict it some more by making f hat over w uh, uh, in h2 of minus pi pi. OK, so we have a decomposition of b pi. We have b pi plus and then b pi minus, which is the same kind of thing uh, except uh, the other way around. OK. So we get discrete chromatic series, we get a uh, convergence result. Here's the, the details. Uh, the start off with H in this space, G given by the quotient of the Fourier transform uh, divided by the weight function, PN of Z, the orthogonal polynomials. Uh, then this inverse Fourier transform of G, CN is the inverse Fourier transform of this quantity. A is the uh, discrete uh, or chromatic difference, as I should say, then this thing converges to H of T uniformly on compact subsets of R. So uh, that's our result for this discrete chromatic series. But it's not very satisfying, is it? Because we always have this condition that uh, 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 H has to be in uh, B sub omega or B sub W pi b sub w plus rather than uh, all of b sub pi. So, um, well, let's look at an example first. Um, if we start off with uh, w of theta given by this <coughs> trigonometric polynomial times the characteristic function of uh, the interval minus pi pi, the so-called raised cosine, then we can find c of t and uh, we can show that CN of t is just a, a linear combination. 
and from then on it's just a matter of uh, plugging in the coefficients so we, we can get the convergence very easily for this particular case. In the case of um, uh, weight something like uh, this also involving trigonometric functions but not integers necessarily then we get uh, Gegenbauer polynomial based uh, orthogonal polynomials. Okay. Now as I said before this result only holds for B W plus not all of B pi. Okay. Now how to get around this? Well we can use a symmetric weight. If W is a symmetric weight, if W of theta is equal to W minus theta, then we have that Pn of z upper minus 1, Pn of 1 over z is also orthogonal systems on a circle. And then we can combine the two systems by setting P minus n of z equal to uh, Pn of z minus 1, and we get a system uh, the following. The trouble is it's not an orthogonal system, but Pn e to the in theta turns out to be a respaces of L2 W minus pi pi. And Cn of t is a respaces of V pi. Okay. Now the problem with that is that uh, the coefficients are, are hard to uh, calculate. These, these are not necessarily orthogonal. Pn and p minus n are not orthogonal to each other necessarily and so uh, uh, we have to come up with a dual Riesz basis and use that in our approximation. And well, there's also uh, a number of conditions on W that I didn't mention. Uh, we have to uh, make sure that the polynomials aren't wildly, aren't wildly behaving, behaving wildly. Another approach, and this is the obvious approach, I should have thought of this first, or well, perhaps I should mention this first. Uh, Instead of orthogonalizing 1, z, z squared, etc., and then trying to fix it, we could just <coughs> work this way and orthogonalize 1, z, z minus 1, z squared, z minus 2, with respect to the weight function. And that way we get an orthonormal system. They're not, they're not polynomials necessarily, but uh, they're polynomials in z and 1 over z. And then we get uh, the result that we want. If we have a symmetric function, on minus pi pi, then the phi ends are an orthonormal basis of L2, and uh, this is the phi n is just a, like a polynomial, a trigonometric polynomial, actually. And um, then this is the result. So we get convergence in L2 of R and uniformly on R, in all of R. If we have h in b pi and we have this type of orthogonality, orthogonality, orthogonal functions. Okay, now there's still a problem, right? The problem involves, um, uh, we're only working with a Paley Wiener space, we'd like to extend this to other um, uh, functions that are not in the Paley Wiener space but are band limited. So we'd like to extend this to uh, the space, which is, well, I'm throwing an epsilon there to, to make sure they, the support of the Fourier transform stays away from minus pi and pi. Okay, then uh, the discrete chromatic series of F converges in the sense of S prime to F and uniformly on compact sets. Okay, now this particular case includes, uh, or does not, I should say, it does not include the Shannon sampling theorem. The reason it does not include the sampling theorem is because we're letting the weight be a, a, a trig polynomial which vanishes at a, a <coughs> plus or minus pi. In the case of the Shannon sampling theorem, uh, W would be um, uh, the characteristic function of minus pi pi and does not vanish at the endpoints. So we don't get this kind of convergence for the Shannon sampling theorem. But this, this does give us a sampling theorem uh, that, and it gives you uniform convergence on compact spaces. That's not true for the Shannon theorem. You don't get uh, uniform convergence in this space on compact sets. Okay, so that's the main result. Uh, here's some references. This is uh, the original uh, uh, 
result that I saw by uh, Ignatovich came out in IEEE signal processing. Uh, later he uh, published another uh, version of it, but which is more abstract. I don't like it as much. And uh, then uh, one of my students and I worked on what I've been talking about today. Okay. That's it. They don't decay very fast. They're, they're, they decay. Well, it depends. You know, it depends on how, how, what the Fourier transform is like. If the Fourier transform is smooth enough, right. like in this last uh, case I show you, then they decay very rapidly. But in general, they don't. They don't decay too fast. Along a similar line, I was going to ask about singularities of the wave function. What role how they impede computation? Singularities of the wave function. Like a lot of the polynomials like have singularities, especially the Kagan power and Jacobi and so on. Of course you didn't consider Jacobi because they don't they're not even. Yeah. Oh in this last case. Yeah, but uh uh, well, the Jacobi polynomials with the two parameters the same uh, turn out to be even that's, that's Gegenbauer polynomials. Uh, now, what, what's the problem? The singularities? I'm wondering about the, the oh, the singularities sing at the endpoint. Yeah. Well, that's that that's taken care of by uh, this condition right here. The fact that it's pi minus epsilon, so everything is is taken away is. Everything is zero close to the endpoint, so it's identically equal to zero. So that's not going to turn out to be a problem. Okay, um, let's end the sticker again.